I think it was on Wednesday, Wednesday or Sunday, Sam, you and I were talking, and I was telling him that um, I really enjoyed the music. I thought it's, your, your church is filled with more musical talent than most places. I think per capita of people that can play instruments and sing. And he told me, he said, well, guess what? Sunday the choir is going to be singing on there. And thank you so much for leading us in worship. Uh, it's been a, it's fun to sit back and watch because not only the, is it, make sure is my, is the mic on? Okay. <laughs> I learned on a couple Wednesdays ago not to make fun of the sound people because Sam was in charge of that and then he shut the mic off. <laughs> but not only to, to listen to the music and then the, the songs that you pick and the meaning behind them and, and such wonderful uh, choices of songs to lead us in worship, but don't you enjoy watching the faces of everybody singing and the smiles and the energy that they have? And they're not getting up there and just singing or being a part of the choir. They're, they're worshiping and leading us in worship. And it just kind of draws you in. So thank you for leading us in worship this morning. Well, it's been 14 and a half months. I'm going to miss Sundays and Wednesdays with you. This has been a fun time for us. And, and you will never know the blessing that you have been to Dana and I on this is that we feel like you just embrace us that first Sunday. And, and ever from that point on, you've just walked with us and encouraged us and made so many friends and and it has been a joy for us. And so as we come to this time, it just seems like a wonderful time that you, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, you begin with your new pastor. What a great way to start on there. I mean, event, any of the Sundays of the, of the year, what a wonderful way to start on there. Well, the last couple weeks, we've been looking at some Psalms. As we've been going through, and, and I wanted to stay with that. I know it's Palm Sunday, but I wanted to, uh, there's a reason, for, I'll, I'll explain why in a little bit. But the Psalms are really important books. So if you're not familiar with the Psalms, usually they're very popular and, I, and people love reading the Psalms, but the Psalms are the hymnal, the ancient hymnal for the Hebrew people. So in their worship, they're going to be singing these songs. They're, so originally they're put to music and their songs of ascent as they're going up to the Temple Mount and there's all different types of songs that they sing, but it's part of their worship. In there, there's all different types. There's songs of lament as they're going through how God's delivering through different, different times. There's songs of penitence as they're being confessing of sin. There's psalms about the, the, the royalty of the king. There's messianic psalms. There's all different kinds of hymns of praise in there. And I think we identify with the psalms probably more than almost anything else, in, especially our Old Testament, because the psalms are an expression of the Israelites' people, their, their life, and their worship, but they're looking over their daily life and the struggles that they have and how God walks with them, and then they put it to music. And so, so many of you can identify with that. You think of a, as we've heard this beautiful song that was sung here, how many of you, and then in the old rugged cross, and the different things as Tim led us today, how many of those songs just kind of resonated in your heart and brought up an experience or a memory in there? And so I think that's why we relate so much to the songs, because they address things that we're feeling that often we don't know how to put to words. Don't you find that? You're going through a difficult time, or you're, maybe it's a song of, of praise, and there's just some things that you cannot put into words, and then you hear a psalm, and you think, they nailed it. Exactly what I was experiencing, they brought up in that psalm, and I think that's why we identify so much with, our, with the book of Psalms. Well, today I want to look at one last psalm with, with you, and it's an important psalm because we look at our day, and we look at what's going on in our culture, and so often there's so many people that feel alone in our culture. You can be in a group like this in a large setting and still feel completely isolated and alone. And some of you may, may be able to identify with that. But if you look at all the studies across our, our country, the things going on, people feel more isolated today probably than any other time. Even with all the social media and with all the different things, people feel like they're going through this life alone so often. And this psalm is an important psalm because in there, when, feel, when, when people in our day seem like they're facing so many things, they feel like, well, we have to go through this alone or, or no one cares about it or have you ever been there where you felt like, I'd share what's going on, but no one would understand. Have you ever been there? I don't even know how to express or think about what I'm going through as we're facing these things, and I don't even know how to tell anybody, and we sit there quietly as we kind of wrestle through issues of life. 
And this psalm is an important psalm because in a day when people feel like people don't care, they're feeling alone, they're not knowing how their future, what's involved with their future, this psalm reminds us how much God knows you and he cares for you. And it's not in a casual way, but he's going to go through this psalm. And as I read it to you, I want you to watch and see how the psalmist is writing it. And he's going to be expressing and writing down this psalm about God's intimate knowledge of how he searches us and knows us and cares for us and, and hedges us in and protects us and watches over us and has wonderful thoughts for us. But as he's writing about this for his own life, this was a worship song. And this was meant to be sung among the people of Israel in the same way from the day that it was written and used in worship there. It goes all the way to our day. And so as I'm reading this, it's not just some ancient writer talking about God's relationship and knowing him. This relates directly to us. As we're sitting here today in this service with all that we are facing, when he's talking about how God has searched him and knows him and walks with him, those same truths are true for every one of us here as children of God. So as I read this, I want you to personalize it, to think about these while, he, while he's writing at an ancient time and he's writing about di maybe different circumstances, the truths that he's expressing about how God relates to him relate to us as well. So if you'll turn with me to Psalms 139, I'm going to read this probably familiar psalm to many of you, but I don't want you just to, to listen to the words. I want you to think about how does God know you? How is God searching you? And again, we don't worship just for the fun of it, do we? We don't read the Scripture just for information. As I'm reading this, and as you think about how it applies to your life, and then we'll go through the passages and hopefully apply it to our lives, I want you to be thinking also, is it how will this impact the way that we walk this week? Because if we just read the Word and then we walk out of here unchanged, it's kind of useless. God never intended us to open up the Word, read it for information, or say that was a good thought, or we had a great experience of worship. He means for us to come and encounter this Word so that as we sit here and then we get confronted with this Word, we walk out of here and it changes our lives and the way we walk during the week. So keep that in mind, and we'll try to bring that back to what difference does this psalm make in our daily lives? So if you'll turn with me to Psalms 139, it's a large passage, and I'm going to read the, we'll read the whole psalm, and then we'll come back and look at different portions of it. It says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high I cannot obtain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, and where shall I flee from your presence? If I send to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take up wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the, light, and, and the light around me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in the secret, intricately, intricately wombed, woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every day. It says, it says, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. When as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them? If I was to count them, they would more, be more than the sand. I awake and I am with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. So they speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them as my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try and know my thoughts 
and see if there's any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. Well, some of you may be very familiar with this psalm. It's an important psalm in our, in our book of psalms. In fact, it has different, different impact on different people. I read, a, I read a study on there where someone had taken a whole group of people and they read this psalm and they said, now how many of you enjoyed this? And it was a 50-50 split. 50% of them said, this is a really, really exciting psalm, and they really they liked the, the, the teachings of it and the implications of it, and the other 50 were terrified. Because what does it say about God searching you and knowing you? 50% of them looked and said, this is exciting to walk with this God who searches me and know me, and the other 50% were thinking, you mean God was listening last week? I mean, I wasn't alone in those private thoughts or those actions or driving on I-20. <laughs> but it's interesting is we do not serve a God that is simply up in the sky or indifferent. And we look at other religions of that day and we look at people today and they talk about this God, this, this indifferent God who's up there and who's not involved in our lives. When you open up this psalm, look at the first words of this psalm. We do not have a God that is uninterested in us, that is oblivious to what's going on, that is so busy with his agenda and what he's doing around this world. As we sing that, and Tim reminded us that he simply spoke this world, in this whole universe, he spoke it into creation. We don't have a God that's so far up there that we can't identify. What does he say he does? A God that knows everything, that has all those things in his mind, that created everything, he says he searches you. He deliberately makes a purpose to go and search you. When he knows everything, as this psalm says, that it's not just that, that he knows everything. He goes in and intimately gets to know you. He searches through your heart and your mind and your thinking. He says he's acquainted with all of your thinking and your ways. He takes deliberate action to know his children. Now, that's kind of exciting, isn't it? For some of us, <laughs> we'll have a time of repentance after for the rest of you. But isn't that interesting that he knows everything, yet he deliberately searches what's going on in you? How involved is our Lord with each of us? And that's why this psalm is so important for us today. He knows you and me. He says, when, I, when we sit down and when we rise, he knows our actions. All that went on this last week, he knows it. He's acquainted with it. He understands our thoughts, even at times when we are confused. Have you been to the point where you weren't even understanding what was going on in your own mind, in your own heart, and you're trying to figure things out? Guess what? God searched you, and he knows your thoughts. He knows every one of them, and he understands them. He says, when we look at that, he says, he searches out our paths. He's acquainted with all of our ways. He knows what we think, what we speak, and what we plan. I want, I want to let that soak for a second. The God who knows everything intentionally, deliberately, on purpose, searches you. And he knows your thoughts and your actions, your words, your intent, your dreams, your planning, your hopes and your fears. He knows you that well. And look at verse 6, as the psalmist is writing this, and he's bringing this in for worship. He makes this statement. On top of that, he says, you hem me in before and behind. He guards us and protects us. Before there's a word on my tongue, behold, you know it all together. But look at verse 6, he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me it is high and I cannot obtain it. Why do you think he would say that? Do you realize that as you went through this week, you didn't do anything alone? If you felt like you were on your own, if you felt like you were stuck in trying to figure things out on your own, if you felt like no one cared, if you felt like no one understood, you were wrong. God was with you, and he was searching you, 
every thought, every hurt, every confusion, every dream, every, every time of, of excitement and joy, all of your future, everything that you dealt with this week, God knew it all together, and it wasn't by accident. It wasn't just his, his knowledge that he knows everything going on. He knew you, and he searched you. Can you understand why he says this is mind-blowing? You mean this whole week and everything I went through and everything I will be going through and everything through last month and last year and when I hit that doctor's office and when, when I got that layoff slip or when I got the promotion or where, where I met the person I fell in love with and walked through all this and I, we had our kids and we went all the way through that. Every single thought you had, he searched you and he knew you. And he hemmed you in. Now, can you, can you understand why he says such knowledge? He says, it's too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot obtain it. But he doesn't end with this. And so with that, well, let me go before we even move on. To, we'll hit kind of each section here. He says, from the moment you got up this morning, your God was aware and active in your life. Now, we may have not, not thought of him. This week, you may have been so busy with everything else going on, and we may not consider him and his ways, but guess what he did this week? He considered you and your ways. We may have been so busy and overwhelmed with things that the things of God and the purposes and the ways of God were maybe not, not on the forefront in our mind or our thinking, but for him, he was thinking of you. He was clearly was aware of our ways and has been present with us this entire week. What difference does that make? Just for this week, before we get even farther, we're at the front end of this psalm. What difference will that make today and this week? As you go to school this week, you're not just going up there trying to do those exams and the stuff and the relationships and all the awful things and good things that happen in school. You're going in there. When you wake up, when you woke up this morning, God was with you, and he knew you, and he'd searched you, and he had a plan and a purpose for you before you ever headed out the door. What difference does it make when you go to work this week? You don't have to raise your hand, but how many people get up on Monday and think, oh, i got to go into work, and you're counting the days to retirement? And that day is getting farther and farther away with our economy, isn't it? <laughs> What difference will it make when you recognize that you're surrounded by the presence of God and it's not just this casual thing or this big will of God out there, but that he knows you and he searched you and every single thought you have and everything you're doing this as you go into work, as you're with your neighbors or with your spouse or with your children, with whoever you encounter, the customer, whoever you deal with this week, what difference does it make that he knows you? And he's searching your heart and your mind. And let me say, he's not search, in this psalm, he's not searching our heart and mind to get after us. Have you ever had someone in a workplace or others that kind of watched everything you did because they're trying to write you up and get after you? That's not what he's doing. Why is he searching you? Why does he want to know what's on your heart and your mind and your thoughts? Because he loves you. And he cares for you. And he wants to know you in such a way to orchestrate your life, to draw you into a relationship with him so that you experience the fullness of a relationship with God, to bring us into a relationship with him. Now, if we just stopped at that point in the psalm, how amazing is that? How will that change your perspective as you go out this week? The God of the universe loves you has plans for you, knows every detail, and is walking with you, hedging you in as you go out. If we just stop there, we're in a pretty good spot, aren't we? Our week looks pretty exciting, doesn't it? Well, he doesn't stop there. He moves on. He says the psalm doesn't stop there. He's overwhelmed with God knowing his ways and his thoughts, but he moves on to another aspect of how God interacts with his people. Let me read you again. We'll start at verse 7 here. He says, where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, it says, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, and Sheol, again, if you're not familiar with that, so this is like Old Testament understanding of the place of the dead. So in our, it's not hell yet in our New Testament, but it's kind of this place of the dead. So if I go down to the depths of Sheol, you are there. 
If I take up the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light round me be, be, be light. It says, the dark round be light. Even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is bright as day, for the darkness is as light to you. So he moves on. Just Not only does he know your thoughts, but he's with you the whole time. And now if I was to ask you, how many of you believe that God's presence is around you at all times? I'm assuming most of us would say yes. We know God is all around us, isn't he? But do we take that and make it practical that his presence is with you? Not that he's just generically around controlling this earth, but as you go around this week, he'll be with you. He knows you and he's with you. He says, there's no way I can flee from your presence in here. So he raises it, he says, it's impossible to be out of the presence of God if you're a child of his. So not only are we in his presence, but according to this psalm, we find that in the darkest places, even in the places such as Sheol, his presence is still with us. In the middle of the dark, darkest circumstances, he says, even if I go down into the depths, even your presence there would be done. Even if everything is completely dark around me, what happens when God's presence is there? It's light. Well, what difference does that make for us this week? As we head to school, to work, how about the doctor's office? As I pray for you, and Wednesday night we get our prayer sheet, and, and you know, I've been praying for you as a church, but I pray for you individually, and I see all the things going on, and we talk about it, not in a bad way, we talk about to pray and on Wednesdays, and I hear different things about what you're going through. Even in the darkest moments, what happens in the presence of God? He's with us. For those of you that are sitting in the dark moments of the doctor's report and you're saying, he says, this is what we've found. Someone who doesn't know the Lord can get overwhelmed, but what do we have? We have a God of the universe that has searched us and knows us and knows every single thing going on us and hedged us in and we are in his presence. When the pink slip comes and you're looking at your employment and you're thinking, how am I going to make it through? And you're looking at those heading that where other people fall apart. Have you left his presence in the middle of that? Not at all. When you hear the devastating news of something going on in your family or, or someone you work with or someone is difficult or is coming down on you and, and you look at this circumstance, you think, no one cares, no one understands, and it looks very dark to me. What does this psalmist tell us? He says, Stop right in the middle of that, and recognize where you are. It doesn't matter where you go, in this city, in this state, in this country, in this world, you cannot flee the presence of God. He says, if I go all the way up to the sky, if I go down below to the depths, anywhere I go, I'm in your presence. But is it isn't a negative thing. What does his presence do? He says, your presence holds me in your hand. Do you realize what it means to be held in the hand of God? How powerful is the hand of God? He says he holds you, and he doesn't just say he holds you. He leads you out of that. And so I would say today, when we're looking at this psalm, if you are in a spot where it looks like it's very dark, according to what the Scriptures testify about our Lord, we just need to change our perspective because it's not dark, not with him. What is it? Even the darkness shall be light around you. How does he do that? Does he change all the circumstances? Often, no. We live in a fallen world, and there's choices, and there's things. It's not about that. It's about his presence. It's about the joy that he brings. It's about the wisdom that he brings. It's about the comfort, the peace that rules and surpasses all understanding that guards our heart and our mind. He says, in the middle of those dark circumstances, when you realize that God who created everything, who knows you, knows every single thing going on in your life, and he says, I'm with you, and I've hedged you in before and be back around you, and I'll lead you, and I'll guide you. What does that do to your spirit? How will that change your week? It's really practical, isn't it? This psalmist isn't speaking out of a vacuum. He's not speaking out of something where he hasn't walked through life and the difficulties of life. He's bearing testimony of God and how he walks with his people. Well, he doesn't stop there either. 
It's a pretty exciting psalm. So he knows our thoughts. He's present with us. But the psalmist takes it a step further. And we'll have to quickly go through some of our verses or we won't get that sandwich later. <laughs> but he says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and the book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet none of them had come about. So he moves from his knowing our thoughts to being present with us. And we'll just kind of touch on this lightly, but you realize every one of us has been uniquely shaped by God. From the very beginning, he says, you form me. Now, it's not just talking about our, our physical bodies here, but every one of us are uniquely designed by God. And it's not just, not just when you're in your mother's womb. He's talking about all the days of your life he's formed and he's fashioned. He's been walking with you from the very beginning. Now, you may make choices that have maybe put you in a bad spot in there, but, it, but it's never changed the fact that the presence of God and his, his working and His molding and shaping you, you are a product of your choices, but you realize in that God has been fashioning and orchestrating and working around you and hedging you in from the very beginning. Now, he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me when you realize and you think in your own life all the way back from the beginning, God's hand has been on you. In my understanding, we certainly have choices to make, whether we're going to obey or disobey. But that doesn't change the fact that the creator of the universe has had his hand on you from the very beginning, and he's been shaping you in a unique way. And it's not some generic shaping because what? He searches you, and he knows you, and he knows your thoughts, and he's been with you. And he formed you. And he hedged you in. But to me, the amazing part of this, there's several things that come after that it just builds and builds and builds. But I want us to look at verse 17 and 18. So if you'll turn to verse 17 and 18 and look at this with me. How precious are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more than the sand. I wake, and I'm still with you. In your translation, it may add in, add in there, how precious are, this, are your thoughts towards me, O God. How precious are your thoughts. In light of the fact that God chose to search you, chose to have his presence with you, chose to shape and walk with you. He says, how precious are your thoughts. But what do we know about God's thoughts? The word precious could be translated extraordinary. He says, how extraordinary are your thoughts. Some of us have more extraordinary thoughts as God was shaping us than others, didn't we? <laughs> but he says, I have all these thoughts towards you. He says, as he's psalmist is writing, he's saying, God, you have these thoughts toward me. You've had them from the very beginning. How precious are they? But how did you describe them? He says, they're more than the sand. Now think about where he's writing from. He's writing from Israel. Any sand over there? More than the sand. How many precious thoughts does God have towards us? Can you count them? Can you measure them? How exciting is it to be a child of God today? How precious are your thoughts towards me for the outnumber of the sand? Speaking from Israel. Kind of a big desert over there, isn't there? And then he described, what do we know about God's thoughts? I want to just kind of take a little excursion. Jeremiah 29 has been a famous passage about God's thoughts, and he's speaking to the, the Hebrew people at that time, but it gives us an indication of God's thoughts towards his people. He says, he says, I don't have thoughts for evil for you, but thoughts that are good. 
thoughts for a future and a hope. And you watch God's thoughts for his people. But I want to take you to a passage because Isaiah has two different things that he says about God's thoughts. One, I'll read, just read one passage, but in Isaiah chapter 14, he says, when God thinks something, it is done. Has anybody ever told you, I plan on doing this, but we never get around to doing it? That's not so with God. Isaiah chapter 14 says, when God thinks something in his mind, it is completed. But I want to read to you just really quickly, Jer uh, Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 11. A famous passage on, on God's thoughts. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are mine, my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from earth, and do not return there but, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed and sowers and bread to the earth, to, to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, and it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish what I purpose and shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. Now, just real quickly, what do we know? We could look for a long time about God's thoughts, but we know when God thinks something is done. He doesn't function in time, does he? He says, how precious are your thoughts towards me. They outnumber the sand, and we know that he has thoughts for good and a purpose and a hope for his people. Isaiah says, when God thinks something is done, and we look at this, and Isaiah explains it, he says, no one can get interfere with his thoughts. What does God have in store for you this week? How many thoughts does he have towards you? He searched you, and he knows you, and he's hemmed you in, and he formed you, and he's been walking with you, and he has these precious thoughts towards you, the more than you could ever number, and they're already done in his mind, and no one can stop them, and they're thoughts that are good. What does your week look like? What does your month look like? You may look at it like the world looks at it, and you look at our economy, you're looking at struggles, you look at what the doctors told you, or you look at struggles maybe in your family or different things like that. But you just stop and think about your God that you serve. And in his mind, they're done. When you got up this morning, God had thoughts for you that he's been working out and planning. And they're already done. It's just a matter of us stepping out and obeying and walking with him. Can you imagine why the psalmist puts this in and is a part of worship of the early church, of, of the early Israelite people? Well, I don't want to stop there. As I look at our time, let me, let me just say that with that, it says, he doesn't end with this. He has amazing thoughts towards us, more thoughts than we could count. They are for good. They're completed in his mind. But with that, he doesn't stop here. He ends up with a challenge. Now, one, uh, really quickly, it's a little odd. Verse 19, I, we're not going to skip it. It's in here. We need to make sure we cover it. But let me just explain to you, because if I don't, you read it and think, Blackby, why would you miss that? That's really weird in here. So he says in verse 19, he says, he says, in light of this, he says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. He says, and men of blood depart from me. They speak against you, malicious intent. Their enemies take your name in vain. I do, it says, do I not hate them who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you and hate them with a complete hatred? I count them as my enemies. What in the world is this doing here in this kind of psalm? Were you wondering that when I read it? It doesn't seem to fit. And some people try to take it out of the psalm. Commentators say, well, it must not fit. They say, you know, he put it in here. It's here. Let me explain it to you really quickly because it's important. When we look at God having thoughts towards us, we look at him surrounding us, his presence. We look at him forming us. We look at him walking with us. We look at him having all these wonderful things for us. It, it makes us, forces us to respond to him. And here, it's, remember, it's poetry. He's not advocating hating all these things in there. What he's saying here kind of real briefly is, God, I'm on your side. 
In light of all that you have for me, in light of all you're doing in me, in light of all that you have planned for me, I'm on your side. When those who are opposed you, I count those people as enemies. He's not, he's not, we, we, he's saying, when you, when you look at that and you're around people that are despising God's name, when you look at people who are using God's name in vain, we're looking at people that are going opposite to God. He said, in light of all you're doing in my life, I'm on your side, God. I'm in the opposition to that. How could you respond any other way when you look at how God has these intents and these thoughts for us? But the response I really want to look at are in the last two verses. Verse 23 and 24, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me and know my thoughts, and see if there's any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. Now, I don't know if you noticed that when I read this. What was God doing at the beginning of this psalm? Oh, Lord, you search me and you know me. Now, is it odd at the end of this psalm he's saying, search me, O Lord? What was God already doing? He's already searching him. So what is he doing? Why does he end this psalm this way? You know, the psalm, the the last end is a punchline for the psalm. It brings in the meaning in there. He says, but the thing about it, it says, God is already searching us. But God can be searching you and you have no, no interest in what he's finding. God can be searching you and know you and have a plan and you can make your own decisions, can't you? God can be searching you and desire all these things and have all these thoughts for you, but we have to make sure that we get involved and we, and we accept those things. What difference does it make if you're trying to help someone out but they have no interest in your help? How successful is that? It's not going in anywhere, is it? The psalm, when we look at all that God does, the conclusion of this psalm is, you're going to be doing these things in my life. I want to be a part of it. Lord, search me. You're already searching me, but show me what you find. Search me, O Lord. Show me if there's any ways in me that are not honoring to you. He says, search me, O God, and know, it says, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me. The psalm declares this amazing picture of God and how he relates and knows his people. But it ends on a really important note. It's not not just how God knows you, but are you willing to go into that relationship and say, God, show me what you see? Now, why is he searching you? Not to beat you up, not to make your life horrible, but to draw you into a relationship with him of love where you get to walk with him and the joys of that relationship. But as he goes through this psalm and he looks at all these amazing things, he says, I'm all in, God. Search my heart. I know you're going to be doing it anyways, but show me what you find. Show me if there's some things in there that don't need to be in there and lead me to be away from those things and to repent of those things so that I'm solely in this relationship with you, so that I can experience all those amazing thoughts that you already have for me. Lead me out of what, when you see what's in me, show me what's in me and lead me out of it to make the changes so I can follow you. Well, four, 14 and a half months ago, I went first Sunday with you, I pr- shared with you a prayer out of Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 21, that I'd be praying for you every Sunday, not all during the week. And I've been doing that. I've been praying that prayer for you. And I thought about our last Sunday together, and I looked at different prayers and different things, and God put in my heart, this is what I'm going to be praying for you from now on. I'll still pray out of Ephesians for you, but this is what I'm going to be praying for you, that this psalm would be real and practical in your lives. Did it become a practical part of your day? For those of you who are having a difficult time right now that are facing everything from financial things to health issues to some people struggling with sin of different things, for for all kinds of things that are hitting you and the world is hitting you, that this psalm would become real and practical that you'd recognize God knows you and he searched you and he loves you and he's forming you and he has thoughts for you. And no matter how dark it seems, it is light when you're walking with him. For those of you that are walking with the Lord and things are going well, but you're looking about your future, I'm going to be praying this psalm for you. 
that you sit before the Lord and you say, search me, O Lord. Go ahead and do what you're doing already, but I want to be involved in that because I want you to shape my life in a way that you can use me. So as you look at the days ahead, it's an exciting time ahead that you're walking right in tune with God. He's using you how he wants, and that he would shape you and use you in a way that it would be amazing, that he would take and you'd have full access to all those beautiful thoughts that he has towards you. And we're going to close with a time of invitation. And I don't know where you're standing, and I don't know if all that's going on in your life. But the testimony of this psalm is true. We serve an amazing God. He's not a God up in the sky that's indifferent to us. He intentionally searches us not to beat us up, but to understand what's going on and to know what's going on so that he can express his love right down the middle of our lives. And if you're here today, you just need to know that God has known you from the very beginning and he's been shaping you and hedging you in and watching over you and helping you become who you are today from the very first breath you took on this earth. And if you're struggling and you feel like things have become dark around you, we're going to have a time of invitation. I just encourage you to just come before the Lord and ask him and say, Lord, search me. Show me where I've missed it, where things have become dark because it's all light around you. Show me your presence. Give me a different understanding. Give me your perspective. Show me those thoughts that you have. Hedge me in and lead me out of there by your right hand. Or if you're looking about this future and you're wondering, God, what do you have in store for me? During our invitation, I give you the opportunity just to settle it with him, just to come search me, O Lord. Show me what needs to happen so that you can use me in the days ahead. I do not want to miss out on your thoughts. Well, let me have a word of prayer with you, and then we'll have our time of invitation. Lord, we thank you that you care about us. Lord, we thank you for psalms like this psalm we've looked at today. Lord, I pray for every one of us today that we would be excited about what you know about us and that you care about us. Lord, if any of us here today are feeling lonely or that we're misunderstood or that we don't know how we're going to get through the days ahead and we feel like we're all alone, Lord, I pray that you would take this psalm and run it right down the middle of our lives to let us know and remind us that you know us and you care. Lord, I pray for all of us today that as we head out of here today, we will be excited that you have precious thoughts towards us more than can outnumber the sand. And they're for good and a hope that they're done in your mind and no one can get in the way of those. And Lord, I pray that we would live expecting that we're walking in your presence and you're fulfilling your thoughts in our hearts and our minds and you're using us to make a difference in our world. Lord, we thank you today and we love you. And we're thankful that you have loved us. We pray these things in your name. Amen.